good evening everybody uh, on behalf of bangalore international center and citizen matters welcome you today to today's session arkavati and her sisters the future of our rivers kaluways and the lakes of bangalore uh, we know bangalore depends on groundwater on the rivers as well as its water bodies and uh, once it was arkavati and rishabavati and the smaller streams and the kalways and the seasonal lakes that sustained the city and then it was a big sister we brought kaveri to bangalore and more recently we now stuck on the idea of getting water from netavati and sharavati rivers and waterways and lakes we exploit them we pollute them we fight over them and we mismanage them and of course we it's no you know uh, surprise that we are struggling with a lot of issues from everything from flood, flooding to water scarcity so what is the solution and but before that do we have the right information to make those decisions uh, nirmala gowda and her and the pani team they developing a very interesting information system on rivers uh, they collecting data on river flows dam storage levels water utilization water quality basin rainfall trends and so much more and it's an initiative to empower citizens with data information and analysis i now invite uh, nirmala to present the arkavati river map first thank you meera thank you for the introduction uh thank you very much for the introduction so uh, like meera said pani.earth is a river research organization it was founded by three of us madhuri mandava nidhi paliwal and myself uh we did a lot of ground work with respect to vishabhavati river and we collected a lot of data so one of the things that we realized was that you know this was years of work in terms of understanding the river basin and and building the river basin narrative and um if anyone else wants to work on it they also it seems to us need to go through the same process so um from the technology background being a software engineer myself and having used a lot of open source software it was an idea was how do we do open source data and make it available freely um for everybody so the decisions um informed decisions informed conclusions can be taken by the citizens and the policy makers as well so this is what uh, we call ourselves as knowledge based um activism it is our vision to for pani.earth to be that destination website for the citizens and policy makers alike uh, uh, to get uh, information analysis and data on all water related and river related issues of uh, south karnataka so the photos that you are looking at here i think everyone is aware of the hisargatta here this photo here is downstream of tipkunalli completely covered with uh, water hyacinth you can see the waste water coming out of there um, from the water hyacinth and this picture is taken from magdi road on one side you can see the waste water come out from the tipkunalli dam side and you can see the construction workers this is the expansion of magdi road the construction workers um fishing for dinner here and this photo here is on the other side of magdi road which is the older bridge you can see the color difference this is taken in november where there were significant significant flows in arkavati on the left you can see some sort of uh, muddy uh, urban runoff on the right you can very clearly see that even with freshers coming down the the quality of water is quite uh, uh, concerning here so uh, the the one of the questions that we kind of uh, get asked is why did we do this and you know what's our journey look like kind of want to quickly uh, explain our struggles to get where we were and this first map here is a hand drawn map that was a very foremost map that we made uh, not being aware of the latest geospatial tools and this map was one made primarily for uh, the lokayukta Loka Yukta in 2018 was dealing with pollution of many lakes of Bangalore. Bairmangla was one of them, and we were representing Bairmangla Lake in the uh, uh, Loka Yukta sessions. And we needed to bring it to the justice attention that Bairmangla's pollution is, uh, and Argo Vrishabhavati's pollution is much more is related to many other things than has been led to believe. especially the apartments on either side of rishabhavati are the ones polluting it and there were all sorts of notices issued to the apartment so we needed to bring to justice 
uh, justices notice that there are several other things that are major contributors to the pollution of Pushabhavati and Argo by Mangla Lake. And to bring that point is when we did this hand-drawn map and kind of um, brought this to the attention of the Lokayukta. And one positive thing that came out of this was uh, Lokayukta's understanding that the lakes should be looked at spatially and that you need to look at the upstream and the downstream. And it is from then on that a map of uh, lakes of Bengaluru that was developed by uh, LDA, Lake Development Authority, that went up on the in the Lokayukta office and every other lake meeting, the first question that the Lokayukta would ask was, where is this lake? Show me. Right? So that was one of the positive impact we've had there. From the written um, uh, uh, paper to we computerized the same and we started building the narrative in terms of the projects and the threats um, the um, uh, the river faces, which is essentially what was in what was on paper were kind of computerized. And the third one here is our uh, 2021 effort during COVID lockdown. We kind of said, okay, now we just have so much data. We have industrial data, we have sewage data, we have rainfall runoff, we have urban runoff, we have pollutants data, uh, um, uh, uh, wildlife sanctuaries on the banks, dams, you know, how do we represent it? So then we kind of drew a line diagram from the origin to, to uh, Sangama in case of Arkavati. And we kind of put all the profiles together. You see these boxes right here. And this profile kind of ran to 48 pages. And if you, we, we sent it out to people, you know, this is what we are looking at, you know, this is just too much information. Um, so that's when, um, you know, one of them told, hey, do you guys know about this geospatial tools? You can use QGIS. Huh. That's when we said, huh. we looked at QGIS and we said, yes, this is what we need now. But then we were self-funded. Right, we've always been self-funded. So now how do we get the resource needed to do this in QGIS? We found out the prizes and it was way, way, way beyond our budget. Um, so then we decided to write proposals. So we did write a few proposals for it and we went to the interview stage. We were kind of discouraged because people said, hey, you are out of your depth here. This is something a river institution or a government that needs to do. And so we were like, hmm. <laughs> we were kind of distraught. Um, we went back and forth and then finally it came to us that, hey, wait a minute, in our previous careers, we were technology people, we know how to do all of these, right? It's almost been a decade, but then we thought we should be able to do this. Then we started exploring QGIS, we went to online tutorials, uh, we, we looked at YouTube videos, we bought books and we learned, we're still learning uh, geospatial tools like QGIS, um, um, spatial thoughts, you know, helped us understand Google Earth Engine. Um, and then to build a website and the information architecture at the back end, we, we kind of looked at Power BI, WordPress. So it's a combination of quite a bit of technology. So we kind of joke amongst ourselves. So this is ecology integrated with technologies. What is this end result of what we call the river basin map and much more to come. And also, I think the, the primary uh, driver for us to build these maps were because we understood a lot during the process of building and also during after building as we see it. So it's kind of for us a cheat sheet, you know, when we go to the meetings with the government, um, unless you have something very solid to talk about and documents that you're looking at, everything is up in the air. So we have been to meetings in the government where these maps have been the basis of discussions in terms of uh, drawing out the action plans, whether it's Karnataka State Pollution Control Board or with meeting with the um, additional chief secretary of uh, environment. Um, so moving on to the next slide, we have very little time, so I'm going to be moving fast here. Uh, rivers of Bengaluru, the, the primary reason we uh, developed Rivers of Bengaluru was um, in our work with Bangalore Environment Trust, uh, we were seeing that a lot of lake restoration models, one of the first steps that they would do is the inlet diversion that happened with Berendu, that happened with Vartur, and numerous other lakes and primarily Bayamangla as well. So when the diversion happens, you are transporting pollution as is from upstream to downstream. So now if you bring the lakes, connect them with the streams and then ultimately connect them with the rivers is when you know what the impact is. So that's how Rivers of Bengaluru came into picture and uh, the, the, the connectivity as well. Here, uh, um, you can see that when the Belandu diversion happens or the Vertu diversion happens, the, the pollution is transported downstream to this river. 
Dakshina Pinakini. So we can also very clearly see that all these streams carry significant pollution load from industrial areas and habitations to Dakshina Pinakini, which ultimately collects in Kaveri uh, Kelavarapalli Dam. And on the west, the same is the situation with uh, Arkavati River also. So the perspective here we are trying to bring is that um, here is Bangalore as an administrative boundary. And these are the rivers that geographically flow into the in and around Bangalore. And as they flow, they flow with wastewater, not with the, the freshers or uh, what is for the Bangalore catchment, you know, the rainfall runoff is actually, actually urban runoff, which itself is a pollutant. So that is what flows in our rivers and it goes downstream. And with Arkavati, it goes into Kaveri near Sangama, which is supposed to near Mekedatu, which is supposed to be our future drinking water supply. So when we put this spatially is when we realize that upstream is where we are pumping water. So we are pumping water upstream to Bengaluru. We are dumping waste downstream to, uh, to Kaveri near Sangama. And what in turn was happening is happening. You can see the red dotted line on Kaveri that indicates polluted river stretches of which this Kaveri stretches one. So what Arkavati is doing to uh, Kaveri at Sangama, the same thing Mysore, Mandya, Madikeri districts are doing to Kaveri, which in turn is becoming our drinking water source. So we have to remember, like Sunita Narain in one of our articles said, we all live downstream. So we, we this is kind of the, the picture uh, very clearly shows is waste coming down, fresh water with significant use of energy going up, and both the waste flow and the freshwater flow going through pipelines are devoid of life. There is no aquatic uh, habitat there. There's no riparian habitat. Everything has been destroyed. So let's kind of take a look at um, uh, Arkavati now. Um, so Arkavati, Vrishabhavati is actually the first river that we started working on. And we have developed maps for that as well. We'll be releasing it very shortly. But then we wanted to um, first release the map of Harkavati because it is a medium river. It's about 190, 172 to 190 kilometers long, depending on uh, who's uh, counting. And here, a few things for us to um, understand uh, here in Harkavati and comparing it to the rivers of Bengaluru. The, we don't have river basin organizations. Our river hydrology is not taken into account for planning, even though the national policy, water policy dictates it so. Uh, ours is mostly they deal with the uh, part of the river that flows in the administrative boundary, if at all the rivers are addressed. Uh, it's only the standing water bodies like lakes that are addressed at this point in time. Um, so we said, you know, let's integrate all the uh, regions in the watershed, in the catchment area, and then come up with the river basin um, map. Then since administratively, you're also looking at the rivers that's coming into an administrative division. So it's also another reason where we're looking at different districts in the Kaveri Basin, starting with Bangalore and kind of mapping uh, uh, how the rivers come in as well. So here in Arkavati, the, the shape of it is the shape of the Arkavati River catchment, right? So what a catchment means is wherever the rainfall, they all make their way to the river channel, right? Here, as you can see, there are several districts. Bangalore Rural is 22% of Arkavati Basin. Ramnagra, as you come, is 50% of Arkavati Basin. Bangalore Urban District is 25%, but then BBMP limits is 6%. But what's interesting here is that the 6% is the major contributor for pollution of Arkavati and Rishpavati. As you can see, these streams that are coming here, this is coming from Pina industrial area. So the industrial effluence mixed with sewage joined Rishpavati. And Pina industrial area, the largest industrial area in Asia, as a matter of fact, pollutes both Rishabhavati and Arkavati here. And 
uh, we realized later on that this industrial area here is missing. It actually also pollutes um, um, uh, the other uh, valley also. Um, at this point, I'm really not sure whether it's the, I think it pollutes the Hebal Nagavara Valley from, from here. Um, so these streams have a measurable flow and sometimes the color of water changes depending on um, what type of uh, effluents go into the water and mixed with sewage, the industrial effluents are diluted by sewage and are also transported long distance because the volume of sewage is high. Um, so here it creates a measurable flow of waste coming from this industrial area. And that is one of the reasons why Tipkunali's water cannot be used because of pollution. Of course, the other one is, you know, the whole river um, stretch kind of dried up. And one of the reasons it dried up is because of overexploited. I wouldn't say one of the reasons, I think the major reason for uh, um, Tipkunali's catchment or the upstream, this stretch of the river drying up is because overexploitation of groundwater. And um, it has already been proven scientifically that surface water and groundwater is a single resource and needs to be looked at like uh, looked uh, into needs to be looked at like that from policy level, but that is not happening currently. So that's the reason we've also brought in that angle of groundwater and how it relates to the river here. And as we look at this map. You can see Vrishabhavati River flowing down here and most of the industrial areas, the Kumbhargod industrial area, Bidhi industrial area and Haru Ali industrial area are on the banks here. So in, we call Vrishabhavati an industrial river considering the proximity to two industries and without exception, there are a significant flow of colored water 365 days 24 hours coming from these industrial areas. The thing about industrial pollution is that they are chemicals that are not biodegradable. They stay, um, uh, they linger in the sediments. Um, when, uh, when, when it rains and there's significant flow, we usually think, you know, it dilutes the pollutants. But as a matter of fact, there's many, much research which says that the heavy metals that are settled in the sediments actually um, gets resuspended in the water um, and, um, and can actually increase the pollution load, right? And heavy metals by nature are non-biodegradable and extremely, extremely toxic um, that flows down here. And this map shows also interestingly the quarries. So we use Google Earth imagery and we've mapped the quarries for the whole of Kaveri Basin. And what we're seeing here is for the Arkavati Basin. And very interestingly, much of these quarries are located next to the big dams. So here you can see proximity to Tipkurnani Dam, you can see proximity to Manchinabele Dam. If you come down here, there are quarries with proximity to uh, Arkavati Dam or otherwise known as Harobele Dam. So it, 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 there's several problems with quarries being so close to the dams. One is obviously much in the media with respect to KRS Dam and the dynamite activities that could destabilize the dam. That still applies. That is a cause for concern, but the nature and nature of the problem is not known in the public domain. But you know, one could reasonably conclude that you have high explosive with such proximity to the dam, the houses and the foundations fall off. So then we can imagine, you know, what could potentially happen to the dam. That's one concern, although there's nothing in the public domain. Um, another concern is the heavy metals and other severe pollutants that actually, um, as you can see, there are streams coming here directly into Manchina Bele Dam. And Manchina Bele Dam is a drinking water source to several villages around and also Magri town. So, um, and so is Tipko Nadi as well. The quarries right here from the past that uh, right now is covered in green and it's not possible to recognize them on Google Earth imagery, um, but they also did feed into um, Esergata Dam in terms of, sorry, uh, Chamra Sagra Dam in terms of um, um, the streams em emerging from the quarries themselves as well. So this, uh, there are several things that we also kind of uh, learned from this is, as we were building it back to back dams is, it seems to that, you know, there is no really, the, in terms of the dam design and the calculations is, is, is a cause for concern when you have so many back-to-back -back dams. And then you come here to Tipkurnali and 10 kilometers down is Manchinabele Dam. 
And when we were doing a chronology of when all the dams were built, um, and also the chronology of uh, Tipkunnali uh, profile, we, it's, it's all this data is on our website. Uh, Tipkunnali profile is a profile of um, the, the capacity of the dam, when was it built, you know, what is its purpose, uh, there's a timeline narrative and what are the threats, we've identified 16 threats that uh, Tipkunnali Dam um, uh, currently has. So when we put all of these, right, when we looked at the chronology, we saw that Tipkunnali Dam, um, the, the government knew that the inflows had reduced from starting from the 1970s. Right, so 1980s, 1990s, still trouble. There's no uh, improvement there. But 10 kilometers down, the Manchina Bele Dam's approval was given in 1988, and then it completed its construction in 1992. And Manchina Dam, much of the water needs to come from Tipkunnali Dam, and it has only 150 square kilometer as its own independent catchment. So here. You know, the, the question is, so are we building more dam infrastructure, despite knowing that there's not enough flows here is is one of the questions that we are trying to answer and it's it's emerging that it is so and we'll release that analysis later. So these are some of the, the things that these um, uh, maps kind of throw out and, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the doctor very specifically diagnosing uh, 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 what the problem is in a human body and then the treatment is given. And I think these maps are crucial in understanding what specifically the problems are. It's not enough to say, uh, there's not enough sewage treatment plants or then there's sewage flowing in here or the industries pollute, but um, identifying and being as specific um, and um, uh, the problem description is key. I think that is what this um, uh, map does and is uh, of help to uh, all of us, the citizens and policymakers, you know, especially in times of climate change, we need to really uh, build resiliency and we need to adapt. It is important for us to pressurize and, and have a dialogue with the government that these issues need to be addressed. Um, moving on to uh, a quick snapshot here, the rise and fall of Chambra Sagara. When we say the rise and fall of Chambra Sagara Dam, so it's also the rise and fall of Arkavati River um, um, as a drinking water source. So Tipkunali Dam has been, or Chambra Sagara Dam has been where it was a source of water, then it became a sink for our waste. So here it very clearly shows from 1934 when the dam was built, to 1956 when the dam's capacity was increased to fold, then to 1970s when the uh, sharp decline in the flow happened, to 1990s where the river actually kind of dried up, and in 2003 is when the government uh, notified the Tipkun Nalli Preservation Notification only to withdraw it in 2013 uh, unsuccessfully. And uh, because of High Court's intervention, the withdrawal was not complete, but then in uh, 2019, that notification was significantly diluted uh, with half of the buffer zones um, being left out, right? And in 2012, the, they stopped being the source of drinking water. And around 2014, 2015, we realized that the, the Tipkunali Dam was leaky. It was documented by MPRI. And in 2015, Kaveri Niravari Nigama spent about 25 crores, um, uh, you know, calling it rejuvenation. Essentially, it is jungle clearance and desilting. Um, you know, that in a bit to increase the flows into Tipkunali. But what they didn't do at that point is that you are trying to increase flows into the dam, but then the dam gate is leaky, but the leaky dam gate was not fixed. So when you build a chronology, meaning to say, the, the significance of the slide here is that you have one is the space and other is temporal, the time. So these two are very critical for us to understand the hydrology, to understand what's happening with our rivers and to address um, and those things. If our strategy for addressing the problems that plague Arkavati is to go 280 kilometers further away to the fragile Western Ghats, and get Yetune Wale water, waters to Tipkunali Dam, I mean, I'm not sure if it's sustainable, 
if it is ecologically sound, if it is if it is a resilient um, uh, solution for us. Um, and uh, just kind of finishing up, and what do we have the rest of the year? We are working on Arkavati River, where we capture the major, medium, and minor uh, water bodies in the Arkavati River Basin and their capacities and what the cumulative capacities look like and who own all of these water bodies. I think there's a total of 114 of them. So that's the Arkavati major minor irrigation tanks here. We're building the profile of Arkavati Dam. Uh, we're coming out with uh, STPs of Bengaluru and how they connect to the hydrology of Bangalore and how it impacts Kaveri in turn, STPs of Bangalore. And the timeline narrative that you just saw, the rise and fall of Tipkon Ali was just a snapshot. There's a detailed timeline coming in about two weeks. Uh, then we have currently working on the Hesegata profile as well. Um, we've kind of tried around to, to bring uh, uh, the industrial area formats and which are the lakes and, and the river stretches that are impacted by industrial areas. So we started off with Durbalapura industrial area. So we're kind of working there as well. And of course, the profile of Durbalapura Nagara Kere. Um, uh, as well. And rivers of Kaveri Basin, we're trying to uh, yet work out how to represent the rivers of Kaveri Basin. And this is our Vrishabhavati River Basin map, which we'll be releasing shortly. And this is the different valleys and lakes of Bangalore urban district, including BBMP. So these are some of the things that we are currently uh, working on. And we do hope that these are helpful to the citizens um, like it is helpful to us. So in terms of empathizing, if it is helpful to us and if it's giving us this sort of clarity and these things are emerging for us and I'm sure it's the same for, uh, for the citizens as well. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Nimala. And that was really fascinating. Do you want to just take a minute and tell us how did you, you know, come up with the idea? What was the inspiration? How did you build the team? And, you know, you, you also seem to have like an emotional connect to rivers, right? Yes, I think uh, when, when people talk to us, it's like, oh, you're so passionate about it. So we kind of correct them. No, 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 we're not passionate about it. We have compassion for other wildlife. Um, I think in, uh, in one of the articles I wrote, my mother is the river and the river is my mother. There is, um, when you go and see these water bodies flow, this a sense of um, uh, mental calmness and a sense of um, uh, regret at the same point saying, you know, what are we doing with these? these? These don't speak. And we are in turn have the responsibility, we in turn as humans have the responsibility to speak up for them. And I think that is what we're doing. And uh, my colleagues, so um, both of them are here. So both of them are quite compassionate about water bodies and they're compassionate about other wildlife. Um, yes, humans need water to use. Definitely, there's no doubt about it. But where do you draw the line between use and abuse is a question that we are trying to answer for ourselves. You know, when do we say, hey, let's have a few more drops for, for that fish that we can't see, for that water snake that we can't see, for that amphibians in the river um, uh, that we hardly know about. Uh, so it is compassion that's driving us here, I would say. Thank you. Uh, we will now have uh, Pinky Chandran as a researcher and waste volunteer, as well as Vishwanath, uh, urban planner and water expert, joining the conversation. I want to start with asking uh, Vishwanath, uh, what your thoughts are? You just saw the presentation. Uh, you know, what makes a river? What makes a drain? What makes a waterway? Both, you know, philosophically and practically. Well. Uh... It's a chronicle of a disaster foretold, right? And it's an amazing effort. It's very good that uh, that people with such passion and compassion come together to put the map out there in public domain and try to get a platform where citizens can engage, where decision makers can engage. It's absolutely fascinating. The, the tragedy of it all is that if you're a sensitive soul, frequent visits to these sites uh, will kill you. So it's not for the faint-hearted. Uh, those who like water, who love uh, the environment, uh, will find it very difficult to, to deal with what's happening there. But it has to be faced and it has to be taken up. And it's nice that uh, these maps are there. There are, of course, uh, issues for debate and discussion. And perhaps we can have that as we go along. 
Thanks. Um, I will. My next question is to Pinky. Pinky, you've been researching stormwater drains of Bangalore in the last few months. So, so tell us a little bit about the project and what you have been finding on the ground. Okay, so I think like for most of us, stormwater drains were just a fixture in the background. But uh, one day it all changed and I was driving past the infamous Ijipura drain. That road was on my daily commute to work and back. But um, one day the plastic filled bed called out to me. And uh, I made my way to stop and stare at the drain and the image continued to haunt me. I knew that the stormwater drain was actually holding up a mirror to our relationship with garbage. And I've, and I've been working in, in, in the space for almost 13, 14 years. And that seeded the idea of as the drain goes. And um, so basically, as the drain goes was, was, was just the spur of the moment after that drain called out to me. And uh, uh, I know what Vishwanath said, but for me, the process of visiting stormwater drains has been deeply therapeutic because over a period of time, instead of viewing them as dark, smelly and dirty, I was able to experience the beauty. And I love photographs. And so the process of photographing also became like an ode to the drains. And I love poetry. And so um, whenever I look at drains and I have conversation with people, for me, it is a, it's a way of, of coming out. So just to say, as the drain goes, is a desire to follow an illusion, dare I say, because uh, as the drain goes, it's also a yearning to explore the extent of the drains. At times I watch it pass, at times I watch it stuffed, at times I watch it swamped, at times I watch it choked, breathless with the buildings engulfing it, at times I watch it, watch it parched with life drifting away, and at times I see it vanish. And then I walk about up and down, straining to see, did I hear the drain beeping, trapped on the ground? How do I set it free? And then suddenly, the magically, it appears. Dark and dirty, yet beautiful. The expanse and the stretch, hanging like an invisible screen, hiding the realms of the beauty, and the spell is broken. So that is what you know prompted me to look at this as a way of viewing and exploring our relationship with garbage and drains. And that's in brief about the project. Thank you. But you also have been, you know, trying to find drains, actually. Like, how, how do you actually identify drains? Because a lot of times it's it's missing, it's covered, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's barely a trickle, it's dry. Uh, and also, as it flows down the wards, you know, and, and it looks different in different places. So how, what what's the relationship between, you know, the geographic areas to the drain? Um, so when I started this particular project, I looked at it, I just made, because the title is As the Drain Goes, I just went on intuition and went on where it is going and where it is connecting. But it's only later on that I realized that we needed to look at it from, uh, from maps and from uh, you know, the, how, the, how it is documented. And so that came in later. But the starting point for me was to just look at the drains as is and where it is flowing in the neighborhoods. And for me, that whole area from Majestic to Bellendur has always been where I reside in Bangalore uh, or where I commute or where I work. And so that was the starting point for me. And then later on maps. And I realized that the lack of maps or the lack of um, accessible maps, like what Nirmala has just rightly pointed out and what we need as citizens is, is accessibility to this, this kind of uh, structure. So that came in secondary, honestly speaking. So as I see, I mean, you, you are documenting drains in some ways. And, and over the years, we've had a lot of researchers, um, you know, from A3 to uh, APU documenting lakes as well. And then Nirmala is now documenting drains, uh, sorry, rivers. And so at some level, Vishwanath, do you think like the way experts and citizens have been kind of pitching in to document, to uh, to gather information, uh, the data. Does this fill the gap in terms of what we know, what the government should be doing and, and the gap in the information that they have? Uh, do we have a reasonably good picture now to sort of act so, uh, so here's the thing, it's important that documentation is done by citizens, 
for the process of documentation itself as nirmala was was explaining that when the team in, uh, engaged in the act of documentation the learnings they got themselves was profoundly large and therefore that will then get trans, uh, transmitted to a lot of people because they engage in conversations with a lot of people so it's very important that people do things themselves in so far as the city is concerned there's a philosophical issue here you know when we talk about water bodies and river close to the city in uh, 1884 to 1886 we had a severe drought followed by famine in bangalore the famous thousand lakes of bangalore was not enough to sur- to supplement or provide water for a population of 2 and 1/2 lakhs in 2 and 1/2 lakh population could not be supported by the tanks and lakes of bangalore so uh, consecutive droughts have a have a severe consequence on the populace right 1 lakh people died due to the drought and famine at that particular point of time so therefore we moved to hesargatta hesargatta itself was not sufficient for us it was designed and operated in 1896 but by 1905 hesargatta was not sufficient for us because the city had grown in population right and so on so therefore tipgodanli was brought in city grows to to drink away all the waters that's provided to it and there seems to be no end to this supply increases demand demand increases sub puts pressure on supply and so on and so forth so therefore there's always this continuous pressure on water so right now we have anyway uh, you know experts and common wisdom saying that the whole idea of getting uh, water from lingannamakki or netravati or yetnahola whatever doesn't really make sense even though of course that the projects are getting pushed now if that is the case then uh, you know are we kind of done reaching the limit uh, for the growth of bangalore i mean do we just need to be practical now saying okay enough we have taken what we can from kaveri we have <laughs> you know we can of course fix the uh, fix our kavati and rishabavati and uh, you know ensure rain water harvesting ensure all the sewage is treated blah blah and be self sufficient yes but does this mean actually that uh, you know right from our planning to uh, you know what the policy is we need to be clear that we can't grow anymore we can't be 25 million 30 million 100 million whatever So, so the thing is this: there are two profoundly philosophical questions to answer. One of them is how much is Bangalore entitled to the river waters of the Kaveri? We are in the river basin of the Kaveri. Currently, we take six point six seven percent of Karnataka's allocation of uh, of the Kaveri River, Karnataka's allocation of the Kaveri River, and we support forty percent of the population of the Kaveri basin in Karnataka. Right. So, are we entitled to some more waters from the Kaveri? as part of the river basin or not we have to answer the question ourselves right so how, how is it that a farmer in mandya growing sugarcane has more entitlement to the kaveri river than a, a slum dweller in bangalore uh, it's a philosophical question to answer there's enough and more resources to support the population it's just a question of where we want to direct it the waters can go to agriculture or it can come to the city the question is can we do the substitution the second profound question that we have to answer as regards wastewater is are we ready to follow the polluters principle and it, is each one of us ready to pay 95 rupees a kiloliter for water which is the true price for water which can then be treated to standards by which it can be released into the environment or do we stay on a subsidy basis and somehow hope that miraculously the institution will sort out the pollution problem we have to answer this and unless we pay the true cost of water these pollution streams will be beautifully mapped but will continue to be a reality the tough question is a financial question Amira, can okay, I so, uh, can I bring another perspective here to this? Yeah, no. yeah. Um, so one of the things from a policy perspective is to um, shift from a water scarce area, which the Kaveri Basin is, and primarily the Bangalore, to a water surplus area. So right now, what we are doing is we are, you know, laying long, long pipelines and bringing water from a what we call as a surplus area to a area that has scarcity so the question is like say for example you take gurbalapura industrial area which is a textile part and when that industrial area was built it was built with full knowledge that the groundwater in that area is already over exploited when the groundwater is already over exploited the question comes in why build an industrial area there now consider kumbalgodi industrial area kumbalgodi industrial area has no source of water it uses groundwater as well consider uh, bidhi bidhi gets water from kaveri pipeline and so does uh, harohalli but primarily it's groundwater so dorpadapura industrial area becomes a very good case study for us in terms of 
should we not be spreading our industrial areas away from Bangalore to a much water surplus areas and especially textiles. Textiles is water intensive for production and as well as water intensive from a pollution angle as well. So why locate them in a water scarce area? Is, is one of the, the policy changes I think we need to look at. And that goes back to you know, how we cater to special interests. There's something called as a location theory, right? The closer you're located to the consumers, the easier it is cost saving in, ter in terms of transportation. For the special interests, perhaps are we, I'm questioning this, I'm not really concluding this, perhaps are we going further and further away to bring water to Bangalore? Is another angle I think we need to kind of explore. Thank right. You. So, thanks, Namala. So, okay, there's one issue of equity and the other about the environmental cost. But I just want to go back into this whole concept of pollute, the pollution and fixing what we have already. I mean, one part about getting water from Kaveri or elsewhere. But given that we have, we have, you know, rainwater, we have lakes and, you know, the rivers flowing. Who do we hold accountable? I mean, but Nirmala, in your, I think, website, I saw this, you know, the multitude of agency, right, from the, you know, Kaveri Nigam to BWSSB to uh, the Center, Central Water Commission um, and uh, KSPCB. So a whole bunch of different organizations are there. And Vishwanath, you've also been talking about it for many years. But right now for the current state, do we, is it the problem of all these agencies who, you know, how do I, as a voter, hold the government accountable how do we get this into the the political agenda so to say because there's a lot of i mean both in terms of uh, you know waste management as well as industrial pollution this none of this is really you know in in popular mind space so to say right um, um you want to go first yeah go yeah. yeah so this a uh, couple of things with regards to this is in terms of solutions that we are looking at, there's no one size fits all here, right? India and especially Kaveri Basin, sorry, Arkavati River Basin is kind of the poster child here, right? It's fighting a million battles, a million battles with water, a million battles with pollution. And each of those battles need to be fought by citizens. And that's what we are seeing on the ground. As part of our work with Bangalore Environment Trust, we were uh, working with the citizens of uh, villagers of Kanakpura in Harohalli industrial area, where a five acre hazardous waste landfill, which was approved by Karnataka State Pollution Control Board, was indiscriminately releasing leachate. This is not sewage we are talking about. This is extremely, extremely toxic hazardous waste that has been released into the water. So we, 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 when we got involved, um, we were harassed. Uh, There's a def defamation suit against me. Uh, our cars were attacked. We were uh, stopped outside of police stations. Um, the villagers who uh, gave us the information, who told us this is happening, sent us the images with which we were going to work with Pollution Control Board. Pollution Control Board on a Sunday night came for an inspection to witness that um, that uh, that uh, leachate release. So that person, whoever came, was transferred out of that position. The villagers, whoever worked in the local industrial areas, all of them lost their jobs. Karna some um, uh, Vijaya Karnataka, some group was behind us, threatening us. And you won't even believe the industry. We were sitting in pollution control board. The meeting started at six. It ended at ten thirty. Right? It was the lawyers of the industry who is running that particular hazardous waste unit telling us that we bought the toxic leachate in the tankers and that they dumped it and we did that and we dumped it near their factory and we had the head of pollution control board, we have the whole administration of pollution control board sitting there, not a single environmental compensation, not a single uh, shutdown of the industry, nothing came up of it. Nothing, nothing. So this is, if this is a situation, and I'm talking about real grassroots work here, if this is a situation that on the ground that we are looking at, how are we going to fix responsibility? There is no administrative will to solve this problem. There is no political will to solve this problem. But by the end of the day, it is the villagers, um, especially who are vulnerable to it at this point in time. So 
it just kind of wanted to get this perspective out for the people on the ground. It is really, really hard. Um, it is, it's monumental. Shunath, you want to add to that? No, so the pollution threat, as uh, Nirmala described, is absolutely there. It's there with the solid waste management. It's there with the biohazards. And those th these are personal threats, which a lot of people have faced in the Arkavati Basin. And it, it's that's the reality of the situation. But regarding the death of the Arkavati itself, the re reduction in the flows, every farm that comes up in the catchment of the area of the Arkavati, every land which is brought under agriculture contributes to the decline in the flows. The process of agriculture is one of filling land, leveling land, and making sure that there's no runoff from the land in an area of 700 to 800 meters. So the people, the farmers themselves, are complicit in the death of the Arkavati in search of a livelihood. How do we address this uh, this uh, conundrum, this dilemma? That's one of the, the challenges before us. Uh, a, a lot of this institutionally, if we have to address, we have to go back to a river basin institution. We need river basin institutions, which are able to do what Nirmala is doing, uh, and do it officially and put it in public domain and take action on it and direct the institutions responsible to take action on it. Till we have those institutions, we are going to be working piecemeal all the time. So, um, so if you look at Bangalore, they've been like fairly impressive community involvement in lakes as well as waste management. But though all said and done, they are like smaller pieces of the puzzle but are there lessons from that that we can learn or is is this like too big a problem it's like you know whatever sand mining or th these are large scale problems that uh, community involvement is not enough what do you think so with domestic sewage and domestic wastewater not industrial component of it with the domestic wastewater we are running one of the second largest projects in the world to treat it and transfer it to the lakes of kolar and chikbalapur right now there are challenges there but now there is a complete comprehensive demand from many of the farmers there who demand that wastewater is a right. So we're able to tie the source of generation to a demand for supply and a demand for treated wastewater, not untreated wastewater, right? So we'll have to reinforce and work on that so that the treatment quality improves in the city and that all, all domestic sewage is collected in the city and then treated enough to send it to Chikbalapur and Kolar to make sure that the livelihoods of the farmers of Kolar and Chikbalapur are protected. Those kind of compacts and those kind of pressures that if they are put on the system, then that's the way forward. We have to come from the future, not come from the past. Uh, but just to add to that, there is still this attention paid to domestic sewage, but uh, what about effluence? I mean, the whole industrial bed, like much of what Namla was pointing, I mean, referring to was all the entire belt from Kumbalgo to Pina, right? That's, we, we really don't have the infrastructure, the capacity to kind of really treat that right now. So once we get the domestic sewage out of the system, then there's a chance that this industrial waste, which is in your face, will force some people at least to act and that the pressure will grow and develop to make sure that it's there. It's not that the authorities don't know. The authorities don't simply act. All the authorities know. Atri has done a report, Nepal has done a report. Everybody knows that there are that there's industrial effluents flowing in the river. Everybody knows that in Pinya, there's not a single functioning ATP, nor is there a single functioning ATP in Kumbalgodo, right? Which is a common ATP. This is public knowledge, but still there's no action. So the million dollar question is how do we get these public accountabilities going? So, so yes, it's it's all about political will. Then how do we get this into the you know, agenda, the next time somebody asks for a vote or next time there is a public, I mean, when there is all this conversation happening publicly, how do you get this to be a, how do you get more of us to care? So, I, I mean, this is an open question. Pretty unpopular, <laughs> uh, Mira, but I, I think you should be answering some of the stuff. But here's the thing, uh, nobody likes it, but there's something called a Kuznets environmental curve. It's only when the economy gains uh, a certain stability that there's a population which has a certain livelihood base and is rich enough that there is a demand for cleaning up of action. This has been the, the what we have seen in Europe, what we've seen in uh, North America, what we're seeing in China. Unless that Kuznets environmental curve is reached and we are getting to be a good economy, uh, we will suffer the consequences of pollution in our streams. Um, India, you've been, sorry, just to build on that, uh, Pinky, you've been, uh, also advocating that community engagement is critical, even at the stormwater drain level, right? It's, it's right now, it's just something, it's nothing but a dustbin for many people down the you know drain. So how, how would you do that? How do you build that relationship that the drain is a commons that need to be cared for? Somehow it's come to lakes, maybe because it's, I don't know, it, it's visually appealing or whatever. Drains can be beautiful too. So how do you get there? So, um, 
I think the 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 problem is if you look at because I've been following the Citizen Waterway project, the K hundred uh, project, um, and I looked at the number of wards that come into the area, and I think there are about eighteen wards. And if you look at the eighteen wards that come under the area, who, which are the wards? I mean, you you have Gandhi Nagar, you have Cotton Pade, you have Chick Pade, you have KR Market, you have Dharma Raya Swami. Um, you have Sudama Nagar, uh, Sudam Nagar, you have Kolkata Nagar, Shanti Nagar, Lakshandra, Ardagodi, Neet Sandra, Vanarpe. And I'm going to stop there because I'm not going to uh, include parts of Kormangla and um, and then you have Ijipura and Nagaram. Now, when you look at the way uh, these communities are, they are uh, inherently uh, one is they also um, suffer from from landscape illiteracy. And that is, in fact, an environmental injustice in its form. Um, uh, the second is also the fact that these uh, areas do not have a voice and do not have an agency in terms of participation. You always hear of citizens in areas of high income communities, which are able to attract media attention, which are able to attract, um, uh, you know, able to interact with with the political constituencies because of the power and um, uh, you know voice that they have. But in all these areas, what they suffer is from inherent discrimination. And the fact the agency to collectivize, uh, collectivize and mobilize so that they are also heard. And, um, and I think that's uh, um, a, a very important injustice. And because they suffer from the lack of, of being able to be heard, they also suffer from the lack of infrastructure. So while there is this whole ambitious project of the Citizens Waterway project being planned, uh, if, if issues of solid waste management and the service delivery options are not addressed, it will continue to plague the authorities. And so I think what is needed is how do we reimagine these communities being able to actually articulate their demands, are able to uh, understand or or become more landscape literate, become more um, uh, you know have more political agency in articulating their demands, and I think that's crucial because without which you will always suffer, and and because of which the city is always going to suffer. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Pinky. Uh, request to the audience if people want to whatever questions you'd like to ask just put it on the chat box in the in the question and answer box and we'll start taking that now um just had like one last question to nirmala and then before we move to the questions um nirmala what is the biggest learning that you have in in terms of the, the cycle of water right the source the usage and then the return back uh, vishwana talked about you know how wastewater is treated and goes back to the farmers so from a Arkavati, Rishabhavati, like perspective, what, what have you seen and, you know, what's the, where, where does it go from here? I am really, really concerned um, about, about uh, the state of our rivers and the state of water bodies and how we deal with them. Uh, it's like the more we learn, the more, um, you know, we become breathless, you know, it's like, oh my God, this is also there, this is also there, and this is also there. And then when you try to find the interconnections, you know, at that point when we were mentioning about sand mining and then quarrying, you know, when we were mapping, um, the, the quarries are right, right next to dams and we need to make a decision, do we want quarries or we want water, right? And then um, a little bit of research, I also figured out that you know, there are private equities which are funding sand my, um, uh, quarrying because the rate of return is just unimaginably high. So you need to stop that funding if you have to stop illegal quarrying, right? And then the, the, uh, the, the, as a matter of fact, there is a huge gap in enforcement. It's not like we don't have solutions to these problems. The solutions are right in our face. But like I said before, there is no administrative will, there is no political will to address it. Um, we need to pressurize our political leaders to have a green agenda, not a greenwash agenda, but really that makes sense for the ecology. And 
also have compassion for wildlife because if there's no water for wildlife, there is no water for humans as well. So these are some of the things I think um, the, the mashir in Kaveri is as important as the drinking water for, for people in Bangalore. So that um, we cannot take every drop of water in the reverse for our own consumption. And we really, really need to be careful about that, especially when climate change is coming on and we're looking at intense storm, we won't be able to use those water um, from the rain because our catchment is so dirty. You know, there is nothing called as, oh, the, there is so much water in Bangalore, so much rain and there's so much runoff and that is usable because our catchment is dirty. So we need to have a clean catchment for us to be able to use that urban runoff um, today. So our policies need to change and we need to know what exactly, I'm not saying it's all public knowledge, everybody knows it's polluted statements, I'm saying number one, this is a very specific problem, how are you addressing it? I think as citizens we are not really being very vocal and aggressive about asking these questions and uh, having uh, holding the politicians accountable, we're all just somehow, <laughs> I would say, flowing in the river and just they go wherever we go. And there is going to be a human cost for that. And it's going to happen very soon. That's kind of for us very concerning and it makes us breathless within the team when we, um, when we, when we are together and we are like, we are always seeing doom wherever we look. You know, first thing is how do we keep ourselves more energetic to keep doing this? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Samala. So I'll just move on to the, some of the questions. I have a few more questions, but I'll come back to that. Uh, so Simha's question is about the impact of big roads like the peripheral ring road on, on the lakes, on DJ Halli. What, what would be the effect? Uh, have you studied that? Nirmala? Oh, you're asking me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Because it's part so, of your, I think it's about your study, the yes, research. Um, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, roads have a huge impact on uh, the riparian habitat. Uh, we have not per se started the study, but at this point in time, we are actually marking where the roads are closer to water bodies, whether it is rivers or lakes, and whether they are inside the buffer zone or outside the buffer zone. Right. So if you're looking at 500 meters on either side of the rivers or the lakes, for example, um, th there are a lot more roads than we want to. Right? And the roads are not only on the banks, but they also cut across the rivers, especially from Manchina Valley down to uh, Ramnagra town and from Ramnagra town to K Kanakpura town of Arkavati part is every few kilometers you have a check dam, uh, a culvert kind of a check dam, uh, a bridge that goes through across villages every few kilometers, which is unnecessary, which blocks off uh, the fr flow of water. And for example, now you take Hoskere Hali. We were looking at the impact of Nice Road on Hoskere Hali. I think Hoskere Hali's degradation started off with Nice Road and the recent um, breach of Hoskere Hali tank for which the destabilization because of the Nice Road being built was one of the reasons. And in terms of pollution, um, uh, and, uh, and I'm quite aware of Nitin Gadkari's plan to kind of harvest water coming off roads. But then my question was, in terms of pollution, the vehicle exhaust and all the, the tire, um, uh, you know, disintegrating on the round are, are hugely toxic to human. And, you know, they are going to get into our body in some or the other way. So these roads need to be green, one further away from the water bodies. And then when they are made, built, they need to have some sort of a green buffer zone on either side to reduce the pollution. I know we cannot not have roads, but then can we have roads that not does not pollute as much? You know, is it possible for us to um, design such green highways or green roads is, is, is a question for the administration, the policymakers, yeah. Thank you. Uh, her next question is about um, how citizens can bridge the data gap. We covered a little bit of this earlier, I think. And But are there ideas for uh, citizen science projects that can kind of add to this body of knowledge that uh, you know you and many other experts have brought in as well as what we already know within the public sphere. Um, Vishwanath, for example, you have in your uh, I think million well program you collected data and, and documented all the the wells, open wells in the city, right? So similarly, are there things that citizens can do? Can you just tell today if let's say a, a federation comes and says, what can we do? What would you tell them? 
look, it's a tough question. See, citizen science is, uh, uh, is slightly over-glorified. It's good for us to learn about certain things for ourselves. If, it, if we think that we're going to make an impact with citizen science, uh, we are uh, exaggerating things for ourselves. So we need to figure out what citizen science can do. It will increase a bit of knowledge, nothing more beyond that. I'm sorry to sound so pessimistic, but that's the way it is. <laughs> But they'll become better citizens, maybe? Uh, yes, some of them will definitely be better citizens. They will do a bit of learning. But this Titanic is sinking. There's no time to rearrange the deck chairs. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, just moving to the next question. Like uh, Nagesh is asking about the textile industry is not meant for the exclusive consumption of Bengaluru city. So there's no reason to locate them inside or near the city. But I, I don't know if anybody wants to take that question, but where does the labor come from? It will come from the city, right? And and it, it provides employment to a certain section in any case. So I don't know if anybody wants to take this question. Is um, it possible to move it out of the out of the cities, maybe relocate to smaller towns? Yeah. I think so. Haroli also, they have about, um, I might be wrong on the number, 400 or 200 acres of land back for textiles. And um, the textile policy of Bangalore is, um, uh, is quite conducive for textiles to come to Bangalore, but then we don't have water. So it is definitely a good idea to, to relocate textiles uh, to uh, uh, places further where water surplus is there. And in terms of labor, I mean, we have, we are seeing, you know, the, it, it might be Harohali industrial area, or in uh, Pena, but I will only speak to Harwal industrial area because I know I've, this is what the ground truth thing has shown me, is that most of the workers are out of state. Uh, I think there is um, um, one person, the lady, I forget, there's a report, Naidu, Sarojini Naidu, not Sarojini Naidu, but uh, there's, a, uh, there's a report which says that much of your labor force should be local locally sourced, but they won't source the local youth for, for the jobs within the industrial area because if they know about the pollution activities, they're most likely to speak up than you bring people from outside. So much of the labor is our people from outside. So if there are people from Assam, people from Guwahati or refugees um, from Bangladesh coming into Karnataka, coming into Bangalore and working in Harvard industrial area, I'm sure they can <laughs> relocate to, um, to different distant areas where there's water. And that's happening. We're seeing that, especially uh, when you see the tourism industry in um, Madikeri or Sakleshpura. Now, wherever you go, you find people from the north, the Assam, Guwahati people working there. So, I mean, I don't think labor is an issue here. Thanks. Thanks, Amla. Um, let me just move on to Sunetra's, uh, Sunetra Kumar's question about consumerism. Uh, Pinky, do you want to take this? It's primarily much of uh, this problem, many of these problems that we are seeing, uh, river pollution, you know, garbage thrown in, all of it is, it, it's connected to solution, to, poly, uh, to consumerism. And as a citizen, what can we do? Um, you know, is it just about protesting against industries, but, or is it changes, changing things in our own lives? Do you want to take that question? Um, I haven't seen the question, but I think, um, uh, for long, citizens have actually externalized and internalized the cost of everything that is in, in, in the public domain. Um, but I don't think so. It, we can look at it in uh, isolation and we have to look at it from a larger ecosystem perspective. And so the governments are also equally responsible. Um, what happens, I think, uh, what is more important is also the service delivery options. Where and how are they structured? Are only the high income uh, you know, communities being serviced or why is the low income uh, communities not being serviced? That's, that's also an important question that we need to consider. As citizens, the, the only thing that will help is if there is awareness built and there is an equal stake in the whole matter. If, if like what Nirmala said, there's passion versus compassion. If you have to build compassionate society, then you need to have you need to be aware enough to to care or you need to be aware enough to act or you need to be aware enough to not do any harm until such time that happens 
um, it's not it's not going to change the status quo. So I think we need to go back to our school textbooks and relook at the way we are taught what we are taught and the way we care about things that actually matter in the long run. So I think that's 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 where I had stuff at. Thank you. Yeah, I think the concept of uh, you know external uh, cost has to be communicated much better. Yeah. Uh, let me just move on to a question about uh, pollution. Um, one from I'll, I'll just bunch of uh, some questions. One is from Kartik Gowda. How does one regulate domestic sewage inflow into streams, considering the urban scenario and there are no buffers between settlements and the stream? And I suppose he's talking about low-income communities as well. And how do you en uh, encourage uh, citizens to stop direct disposal into the stream? Um, Piggy, you talked about service delivery as in waste management, uh, waste service deliveries in the communities as well. Uh, on a related note, there's also these two questions about um, making uh, the pollution control board accountable to demand better pollution control of the water bodies. So um, is do you want to take this, Nirmala, about holding pollution sure. control board accountable? Um, and I can also answer the BWSSP sewage question as well. Um, sure. Why is so much sewage flowing in our drains? Uh, we, we, we are analyzing our, uh, the STPs of Bangalore. Bangalore has 36 STPs. So the, the, and we are, as a matter of fact, according to the numbers, our uh, capacity of STP quite matches the capacity of the waste. But yet we have sewage flowing in our um, uh, strong water drains. So this goes to what we call as a pipeline losses. Now consider Kaveri pipeline, you know, we, we are looking at um, somewhere around 37% and the numbers change. We are yet to receive the RTI data from BWSSP, but going by what is reported in the media, we are looking at somewhere around 37% of pipeline losses from, uh, this is the drinking water pipeline losses. So one can imagine what could be the sewerage pipeline losses, right? So how much you have the STP, but the sewage has to get to the STP. And by the time they get to the STP, most of them are lost in transit. So that's one important uh, reason why it flows. And another one is low income community slums. Bangalore is, there are so many slums. Right? Slums come under slum board, not under BWSSP. So BWSSP does not give connections in slum board. So what do they do with the water flows into the drains, right? And it is, the Bangalore is expanding faster, like BDA is doing a layout and then they all put the drain, they, they all connect their drainage directly. The manholes itself are on the stormwater drains, right? So that's exactly what has been um, traditionally also, I was actually uh, surprised to see in one of the gazetteers, um, going back to Vishweshwaraya's uh, time, where one of the questions to him was, you know, what do we do with sewage? It's like, leave it to the nearest drain. You know, at that point, the sewage was not even toxic. It would flow down to the, uh, to the next tank and it would be used for agriculture. But now, you know, going by the same thing is, is completely different. You know, in 1930s, what worked in 2020s, it is not going to work. Right? That's one thing about the pipeline. And in terms of holding <laughs> Karnataka State Pollution Control Board accountable, I think I do have uh, four or five years of experience working with the uh, Karnataka State Pollution Control Board. And I don't mean to discourage people, but I want to say kind of factually, oh Lord, I mean, I don't know how you're going to bring them around. <laughs> so, um, we were able to get them to issue closure notices to a few industries, um, but we were completely unable to get them to uh, levy environmental compensation as ordered by NGT. Um, we are hoping that maybe we spend another couple of decades of our lives with KSPCB, maybe something comes out. <laughs> Um, we are desperate for hope here, so we're still trying to say, hey, do work out, we'll see something later. <laughs> Uh, Pinky and Vishwana, do you want to add to it? Both of you have also worked with PCB for many years now. Pinky? Um, I don't know, actually. <laughs> That's a very difficult question. But I think, uh, um, you know, until and this, uh, uh, there are many, many layers to it. One is, as citizens, uh, we need to be informed and we need to be able to articulate our demands. The second one, I think, with the KSPCB is we need persistence and we need patience. 
uh, to be able to uh, um, put for uh, put forward our demands. And uh, I mean, going by the past example, um, I know that, for instance, ESG has been very persistent with the um, Marvili Pura uh, landfill closure, but that again started from a long journey. It took a couple of years time to do that. So, like what Nirmala said, they have while they have managed to do that, and I and I remember reading this um, this article about encroachments uh, by Malini Ramnathan or some, uh, uh, and she, and she talks about it. While it's very easy to uh, you know to uh, because encroachments is is loaded with this whole term of illegality. Um, uh, you know what she says that while it's easy for us to um, address the low income communities as encroachment, it's very difficult to. Move golf courses, apartments, and malls from encroachment. So I think that also has a very high political connotation. And so, unless and, and until we all come together as citizens to demand for better governance, it's 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 a Herculean task. Vishwanath, over to you. No, uh, it's uh, the first question uh, regarding the uh, the sewage. We have to understand the legacy effect, also the hydrology and the civil engineering component of it. No, we can't negate it. It is inevitable that sewage lines have to run in storm drains. It cannot be otherwise. If we are going to run it in any other place, this will be high places, which will mean extensive and very deep digging and therefore very costly infrastructure. Yes, that the sewage lines themselves will have to be watertight so that they don't flow into the storm drains. But what do we do with the legacy of sewage, which is more than 110 years old? Some of the sewage lines... Uh, most of the switch lines are 50 years old. What we have is a broke institution. The BWSSP is broke because it cannot even recover o &M costs, right? So if you expect a broke institution to be even doing o and operations and maintenance, forget capital investment to make universal connections, how do we expect it as citizens, right? And we never ask the financial questions, right? So somehow, beg and borrow, they bring uh, monies from JICA, from World Bank, from Asian Development Bank, and therefore, projects are going on. It's never internally funded. How do we crack that? Million dollar question. We must have universal connection. We must have universal connection for water and sewerage. That should be debated at a ward committee level. Every ward committee should decide how many households are there, how many of them are connected to the BWSSP, both for water and sanitation, and they should discuss how they can get 100% connections, including the low-income areas. So it's a democracy issue, it's a democratization issue at a decentralized scale, right? Plus, it's a financial issue at a centralized scale at an institution scale. Both of them will have to be answered in tandem. As regards the Pollution Control Board, there is no hope. There is no way that we can change that institution. We'll have to figure out how Pollution Control Board will be changed into Pollution Regulation Board or some other form of, again, being democratically accountable, not just a chairman being politically appointed, but more democratically accountable so that citizens can then hold officers and chuck them out in every five years if it's so possible. That's the only way out for us. Right. So I think that's a very important point. Fundamentally, I think it's, it's uh, you know, the, the governance issues are, the structural issues are at the root, are the root cause for many of this. Uh, but I'll just go back to the financial point because there is a question related to that. Uh, would a pricing, uh, you know, a better pricing policy ensuring the water uh, costs are more aligned to real costs, will that work? Has that worked in other global cities? So that's a question from Dharmarajup. Absolutely. I mean, uh, sorry for if I jumped the gun. I'm sorry, Nirmala and uh, Pinky. So this pricing is uh, so one of the things that I've been working on for some time. So, so one of the things is we have to capture the human right to water. There has to be a certain volume of water delivered daily of adequate quality, which should be free, in my opinion. That number can be debated whether it's 50 liters, 75 liters, or 100 liters. But beyond that, there has to be an economic cost recovery. And for sewage, for sure, there has to be a cost recovery. If we don't recover the cost, there is no way that the investments can come in to make the system reliable, robust, and strong, right? But once the costs are realized by the institution, we should then hold the institution accountable. Then there's no excuse. Right now, there's a compact. Every, every citizen in Bangalore who takes 20,000 liters of water a month gets a subsidy of 1,650 rupees a month. How can the rich have their snouts in the till and then demand that the environment be cleaned up, right? That's no way that that's going to happen. So we have also to head on address the financial uh, issue, keeping human rights in uh, mind because water is a human right. Thank you. Uh, they just, uh, I, I will just stick with you, Vishwanath, just one question very specifically to you. Can you please explain the difference between the six major lakes that are used to supply water in Mumbai vis-a-vis -vis the dependency on the Kaveri River Basin? 
for the potable water supply in Bangalore. Can Pelandur and Vartur Lake be used to augment water supply in the east and southeast regions of Bangalore after silt is removed? Silt and effluents and lots and lots of other stuff as well. But yes, is 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 this really a practical thing if you can fix the so the quality? Bombay, the, the rainfall is three thousand five hundred millimeters to. 4,500 millimeters in the Western Ghats portion of it. So that's a completely different ecosystem. Those lakes, Vaitarna and others, which are in the Sanjay Gandhi National Park and beyond, are actually full of water because thanks to the Western Ghats and a lot of water. Here we, are, uh, we get 970 millimeters of rain in some parts of the city and some parts 800 millimeters. Now, all the lakes of Bangalore, if they're filled with clean, fresh water, if we start to put the demand, which is the current demand, 2,250 million liters per day, will not last us for 15 days. Lakes are not meant for drinking water at all in Bangalore. Lakes now in the current pipe sub water supply context are meant as social, cultural, ecological, biodiversity, and many other reasons we need to hold on to the lakes, not for drinking water uh, uh, purpose at all. Can you imagine that you stick a straw into Jakut Lake and drink up all the water? It'll be gone in 10 days. Then what happens to the lake, the ecosystem, the bird biodiversity, and everything at all? So therefore, we must come to terms with our uh, link to the Kaveri. Kaveri and Bangalore are closely interlinked. Again, we have to address the question whether what right we have on the river as part of the being part of the river basin, if you're taking as a unit. And I take a sort of a, a bit of an umbrage with Nirmala because one of the advantages that we get of us being situated at a high point and the water being pumped up, the water can be cleanly pumped up, is that our sewage treatment can become much more easier because gravity allows us to do the collection and make the treatment easier. We have to seize one point or the other. If you're down in a coastal zone, then your sewage needs a lot of pumping and a lot of energy. If you're up on the hills, water needs a lot of pumping and energy. So there's a trade-off now in the kind of urbanization we see. A city of 30 million or 20 million people to deal with services is a nightmare. My sympathies are with the engineers also to a certain extent, the kind of uh, physical infrastructure they have to deliver. Thank you. Uh, there's a question on the K100 project. Um, Pinky, you want to take this? Uh, Karthik Gora is asking, does treating the river edges need to be like the K100 project? I think his question is, does it need to be uh, designed the way it is now with, uh, you know, uh, cemented and, and like the Sabarmati river front? Uh, or should it be more natural, uh, you know, allowing the drain to flow like the old Kalways used to be? What do you think? Um. Well, I think uh, I mean to go back to that. Uh, while aesthetics uh, does play a very important role in the imagination of an average citizen, uh, what is actually needed is how can we be more water sensitive and waste sensitive. And having said that, what we also look, look uh, what we also need is a water literacy program, because how do we build connection with water? Because all of us take water for granted. And until and unless there is like shared ownership and management of, uh, uh, you know, water assets, be it rivers, drains, lakes, tanks, whatever it is, nothing is going to come of it, whether it is in a natural setting or whether it is in a purified uh, setting. I think what needs to be, what needs to happen is how do you build in the community involvement in that, like what lakes have gathered in Bangalore? But in the larger ecosystem of the space, how do you make people responsible? And until unless that is achieved, and it has to work in tandem, like you can't beautify a place until and unless you fix equity of essential service. You like what Vishwanath just mentioned that you need to have a, a certain amount. Water is also a human right issue. How do you ensure safe, secure water supply? How do you ensure reliable, um, uh, you know, sanitation? How do you uh, have equitable access to flood protection? How can it be more affordable? I think all these interconnections need to come in place and it cannot be worked out in silos. You can have a beautiful stretch, but at the end of the day, it is just public money going down the drain until unless all these other things are connected. I, I would disagree with Pinky and if you allow me that space to, to do that in terms of... Uh, see, the, one of the things is that if we want to go from place A to place B, there is a lot of sub-optimization that we have to work with. If we want to solve it out completely intellectually and theoretically, we will never take action in, here, in, in the Bangalore context, right? So Naresh has been driving the project. Uh, one of the things that the project has already achieved, that is 100 million liters of sewage, which was flowing in the drain, has been taken out of the system and put into the sewage treatment plant. In itself, it's a victory. Regarding the specific question of whether the drain should be 
more gentle, more earthy and not like this concrete. You know, Bangalore city now gets an intensity of rainfall of 180 millimeters an hour. There's an urban heat island, there's a climate change effect and the intensity of rainfall has really, really gone up, right? 180 millimeters. The coefficient of runoff, the runoff that reaches the storm drain used to be about 15% to 20% is now 90%. So that's a factor of six increase in the runoff because of the hardscape that we have done to the landscape, right? And that's the intensity of vapor. There is no way that we can design a drain with to accommodate these kind of intense storms unless it has very strong concrete sides and base because the scouring effect of the velocity will be so high that it will need a floodplain of half a kilometer for it to be accommodated. Do we have half a kilometer to do this Nambi Pambi environmental friendly or landscapey thing? Or are we practical and do a compromise between that till we reach the ultimate goal 20, 30 years of being able to design it better. Sometimes environmental argu uh, arguments are not based out of engineering logic and both of them have to talk together. It can't be dreamy stuff all the time. I agree, but I, uh, all, I, all I want to say is that you might beautify a place, but if you don't fix issues of sewage and garbage, it's, it's again going down the drain. That's what my <laughs> argument is all about. Pinky, I'm on your side. Pinky, actually, but once you have a, a goal to visualize and then you, you have to work with community, you have to make sure that there's equity, justice, and that there's people who are involved with it. It's a project which has to go hand in hand together because only together can this be sorted out. It can't be so sorted out by one or the other. Right? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'll just take a couple of last questions. We're running out of time. Um, there is a question by Ishwar, but uh, political messaging of environmental efforts by citizens, it's, and these efforts get the shade of foreign-funded anti-development protests, and, and there are instances that this was true. How do you avoid public opinion pitfalls while fighting for the environmental initiators of Bangalore? <laughs> Who would like to take this? Nirmala should answer whether she's foreign-funded or she's self-funded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not foreign-funded, I'm self-funded, definitely. <laughs> But I did not yeah. understand the question. Can you repeat the question, please? I think it, he's talking about, uh, you know, there's this perception that anything, uh, all many of these environmental protests are sort of anti-development and, and foreign funded and they're deliberately done, not really speaking up for, uh, you know, environment concerns of the local communities. So um, that is not true, I think. And it's, this is not a question that's very particularly answerable. <laughs> There's a lot of speculation in the question. So we can. I think it's also about a narrative that ke keeps getting built more on like yes. know, social media, mass media. But ground reality, I think, when people really work on it, is, is probably a different ballgame. What we see is genuine concerns of the people who are really living close to high pollution events. They, they are concerned about their food. They are concerned about the, the, the livelihood of themselves and how the children are going to come out, you know, how they're going to live. They are concerned about diseases. So, um, and I don't think it is an anti-development narrative. I think is development needs to be sustainable, you know, so, so the benefits is intergenerational and it, it's kind of expands and you know, the, the resources are exhausted in a longer time rather than in a shorter time. So we want development. Without development, I don't think we would enjoy the kind of prosperity today we are enjoying because, you know, we opened up our markets in 1990. But how do we do intelligent development and not succumb to corruption? I think most of these anti-development thing comes from corruption. <laughs> right. Okay, so there is a question uh, from Nita about what are the ways to rejuvenate such a large area of the Rishwabhati Valley? Is it even feasible? I don't know. And Nimla, you want to just take it and uh, we can quickly wrap up. And I have one last question for everybody. Is it feasible to uh, clean up uh, Rishwabhati? Is that the question? Yeah, the valley itself. How do you rejuvenate the entire... Uh, yeah. No, it is not uh, uh, practically feasible, but is it possible to prevent pollution? Yes. I think we have to understand what clean means, what restoration means. Restoration means you stop the assault that's happening now and the ecosystem and the, and the life comes back. Um, uh, so, and, and then again, cleaning as in, you know, uh, uh, Vishwanath really mentioned some of the engineering and structural and financial aspects of it. So yes, there is going to be some pollution and our notion of clean water also has to change, right? Vishwabhavati, 
yes the water comes in how do you stop industrial pollution i think per se if there is just sewage flowing in the natural drainage and the uh, filtration capability of the river actually takes care of it it's the industrial pollution that exacerbates the issue so the question is you know can we prevent that and preventing that is sufficient for shivaji at this point in time but that's not at all our current focus unfortunately thanks um pankaj sampath has a hand raised but pankaj can you just type a question uh, we kind of running out of time um i just had like one last question maybe we can just uh, sort of end on a more hopeful note i i don't know sometimes you look at it it's all of these problems are so complex you know such wicked problems so where do you even start so maybe can we look for some inspiration some you know happy stories where things have actually worked things have got better any examples of projects uh, you know in india elsewhere uh, whether from initiated by the government or by civil society where things have actually changed and are there lessons from that here um, i an open question to everybody <clears throat> i think um, i was reading uh, this book called the uh, Uh, the Chain of Water by Anuradha Mathur and uh, Dilip uh, Kuna, and I think uh, what I what what intrigued me was this this whole chapter on the um, uh, Lily Creek project, where uh, they actually looked at how um, and it's it's by Annie Wiston's friend. Uh, it's called Restoring Water, the chapter uh, Mill Creek, sorry Mill Creek Watershed, and. and and the and the chapter actually talks about how they got the community together because initially the community thought that the that the that the entire thing was um uh, you know was something which was in the margins in the periphery uh, not something that you could take pride on and how they came together and they got this whole community together they increased the whole this whole thing about landscape literacy also came from there and how they got the community together to actually feel pride about it so it it started with schools and then it it built on with the community i think that was a that was that is an interesting exercise of how do you actually look at um uh, you know building a a a, a large scale community in, initiative by reimagining and by questioning questioning the whole thing about like for instance with the storm water drain if it's passing through say ejipura or aragodi where the slum is how do you get the community to feel pride and i think it's it's an extensive project and i think that is something it's a very interesting starting point thank you vishwanath you want to come in yeah yeah come to jakpur lake take a look at it battle has been joined over the last 7 years citizens groups are working with institutions we now have bird biodiversity which is comparable to ranganthito in some ways pated storks roosting and nesting all the time pelicans there livelihoods also twined in fishermen are making a livelihood grass cutters are making a livelihood people who are earning a livelihood of the lakes are welcome into the lake and are working together with the richer citizens to to sort out the problem we have a uh, i at least don't know of any industrial pollution case that's being cracked uh, well but uh, in so far as domestic sewage is concerned and institutional cooperation is concerned i would put uh, for chakur lake i would urge everybody to come take a look at it. any examples at a larger global level where you know especially from an industrial pollution perspective things can have changed it, it, classic amsterdam is a clear, classic example with all its canals getting clean but it did so in the 70s right 1970s when uh, holland could get to an industrialized level or stockholm with cleaned up its lake and now it's drinking water quality but that stockholm did it in the 1960s it, or singapore is a classic example so all the examples that we have around water bodies or the thames being cleaned in london right with the fishes coming back and the dolphin coming back into the thames but all these have been part of the industrial uh, industrialized uh, economies which have reached a certain scale uh, in their economy and then are able to invest in cleaning up pollutions we seem to fall into the classic capitalocene trap of first des- desecrating nature then trying our best to restore it and pushing our pollution footprints into other nations as far as possible we'll have to find another china that's true but do we have the time i mean <laughs> i mean that's probably a rhetorical question but <laughs> uh, 1.5 has already been reached 4 is a distinct possibility the titanic is sinking so let's not get the de- uh, get the delusion and let's paint the deck chairs as beautifully as possible that's what i say okay this was actually supposed to be a question to get some 
you know positive hopeful feel good answer so maybe i shouldn't get, go down that road uh, so i will la nirmala gowda last point so it could be yours what would you like to uh, new york city new york city's water supply and the way they're protecting their catchment i think for me is a very stunning example of what can be done and i was always in my when i was doing the dgr source of drinking water and how we could have protected the catchment i kept going back to new york city and its effort to um save the catchment to provide clean drinking water and without any expensive filters one of the cleanest water um is uh, is in new york city one and when i was in san francisco um i, I kind of forget the details but um the the courts there ordered um water for a small fish called delta smelt and it was one of the landmark judgments that was made to protect uh, uh, i think uh, to prioritize uh, river water for fish over humans but i do forget the details it's been quite a while but that's i think is a very stunning to have to save some water for wildlife is is kind of very stunning for me yeah thank you thank you everybody and i think we've kind of uh, covered a whole gamut of uh, you know possibilities from governance to financial instruments to uh, the court um, in our endeavor to kind of improve our rivers lakes drains culways uh, so i think there is definitely hope and if bangalore as a community and anyway bangalore is known for being vibrant and active and actually willing to do stuff i think there is hope So on that note I'd like to end and thank you all to the audience and good night thank you Meera thank you Vishwanath thank you Pinky take thank care you.